Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Norton from Home. My name is Glenn Tomlinson, and I'm the William Randolph Hearst Chief Officer of Learning and Community Engagement at the Norton Museum of Art. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Robert Evren, who will join me to discuss the special exhibition uh, that he has organized and that just recently opened at the Norton called Dynamic, Squalid, Splendid, Themes of the City. This exhibition in the Rays Gallery on the second floor of the museum will be on view through November 7th. I'd like to introduce our guest. Robert Evren was educated at Pomona College, where he was awarded an honors degree in art history and a research fellowship in his senior year. His studies originally focused on Renaissance sculpture and later on modern and contemporary art. He's worked as a researcher under the Mellon Foundation at the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, where he also was co-author of the third major catalog of that museum's permanent collection. Later, Evren worked as a curatorial assistant in the Department of Drawings at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where he organized the first US museum exhibitions of Michael Craig Martin, Sarah Lucas, and Stephen Pippin, British artists, all of whom later achieved worldwide recognition. For over a decade, he worked as a private dealer and independent curator, and he was par a partner to the Mexican Tapestry Workshop where he initiated numerous projects with contemporary artists like Francesco Clemente, Terry Winters, David Sally, George Condo, and Jorge Pardo. He wrote on Cecily Brown for her first exhibition catalog, which was named a Collector's Book of the Year by Art in America in 2000. More recently, he's a contributing author to With Observation and Imagination, Still Lifes, Genre Scenes, Portraits, and Landscapes from the Saunders Collection. This volume is edited by Arthur Wheelock and is a forthcoming publication from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. So in 2015, Evren became a volunteer curator at the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, where he conducted the first complete survey of the museum's 2000 plus works on paper. After finishing that, he was asked to stay on as a consulting curator with responsibility for the reinstallation of the old master galleries in the new building by Foster and Partners. After that, he organized the exhibition Small Worlds, Five Centuries of Prints and Drawings from the Collection. And he's also the curator of Beaching the Boat, Evening Light, a masterpiece by Joaquin Sorolla y Bastida. And that's where I'd like to begin today. Today, Robert, welcome. Hello. And um, as we, as we uh, engage in this conversation, I just want to encourage all of our visitors to add their own questions uh, to the chat box, which I'll be monitoring as we continue. Uh, but if we could bring up the first slide. And Robert, this is uh, an image of the, um, of the Soroya painting, which is on view at the museum right now. Um, tell us what you learned as you were, as you were pulling this uh, exhibition together. Well, I learned a lot more about Sorolla than I ever knew before. He is, I've described him as the blue whale of Spanish painting, which is to say that for someone of his importance and size, he's really not seen very often. Um, he's an artist who I would compare, say, if you want to think in equivalence from different countries, that uh, Adolf Menzel from Germany, uh, William Merritt Chase, and John Singer Sargent from the US, basically, uh, traditional artists who incorporated, you know, advanced, uh, you know, techniques into their style. Soroya was an incredibly successful student uh, who became at the age of 40, one of the leading artists in Europe. And this work this is done in his native Valencia is the most, as the curators for a landmark exhibition 2009 at the Prado noted, um, this work is the most achieved most ambitious, most dynamic, most most everything of all the kinds of, you know, all the similar works that he uh, did in Valencia. And one, art, one guy with an, a lovely poetic touch suggested that there was something almost Homeric about it, about the men beaching the boats and the, you know, the life there, the ocean and the animals all presented as a kind of a frieze for you to look at. What's happening is there's a team of six oxen they're being maneuvered around and eventually they'll drag the boat up onto the beach. This would have been, if not a daily occurrence, at least a weekly one um, for the fishermen. Now the thing about Soroya in this is that he's perfectly poised between 
Oh, what I would call a tra traditional Spanish realism, where you know the fall of light picks out textures very well, like the you know also the, the gloss on the the hides of the oxen and the textures of shirts and so forth. At the same time, with tubi or at least you know unmixed colors, uh, stuff that seems to have come straight out of the tube and loose brushwork that you see, particularly in the water rushing around at the bottom, where there's some incredibly strange, beautiful green. green. And it's this poise, this kind of equipoise between his realism and his impressionism that kind of makes this a classic moment in Soroya's art. Uh, no less a person than Monet called Soroya the master of light. And so I think what's happened since the 2009 Prado exhibition, there's a more recent exhibition at the National Gallery in London, and that is the Soroya is beginning to really reclaim his international reputation, which for so long had been a, a, a matter of, he'd been kind of a matter of private veneration by Spaniards. So there we have it. Oh, by the way, it's 10 feet tall by 14 feet wide. And there's a bench in front of it that you can sit on. And it's really like going to the theater. This is a picture you feel you almost want to watch like a movie. Absolutely. Now this was, this is coming to us as a as an extended loan for two years from the yes. Hispanic Society in New York City, where, as I understand it, he not only visited this the Hispanic Society, but then later created a cycle of murals for the Hispanic Society. He did a cycle of murals. There were twelve murals uh, representing the provinces of Spain. It was an enormous task. Uh, he started on that, I believe, it was after he actually had a retrospective which if you can imagine had an astounding 357 works. <laughs> you can imagine the shipping from Spain to get and the crating to get those over to the US and up. Archer Huntington was the founder of the Hispanic Society and bought this painting uh, and was one of Soria's great uh, promoters and defenders. Well, thank you for, for introducing us to this work. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I know that we will be offering more programs uh, coming up in the future months of a, of a variety of types. And, and we look forward to bringing those to you in relationship uh, to this uh, work, which as I say, will be on view for a couple of years at the Norton Museum of Art. So um, if I could have the next slide. Um, as you enter into Robert's uh, newest installation uh, the, on themes of the city. Um, this is your first view. Obviously, we're dealing with a much different scale than the Soroya. These are works on paper and prints and drawings. Um, and really draw, I think, Robert, you can comment on this perhaps a little better, but really sort of draw upon um, the wealth of knowledge that you have now about the museum's collection of works on paper. Well, there are several birds I wanted to kill with one stone. And um, after, it was kind of a natural thing after having done the survey to sort of ask yourself the question, well, what could be done with this? Uh, what do we have here? Do we have enough to do, you know, a decent show on say, uh, you know, sketches or uh, the nude or, you know, whatever subject for drawing and prints you might want to do. and. One of the ones I had was I thought, well, you know, you kind of do urban scenes and city themes. And I didn't really think much of it until it came time and I had to think up something to go into the space. And it all came together with um, oh, consciousness of uh, what COVID had done to our cities, literally empty them. Uh, maybe we could look at the next slide. And here, for example, is a slide of Piccadilly Circus, which has its customary gaudy lighting and all the rest, and is absolutely devoid of the crowds of people that usually mill around here and sit by the edge of the fountain and all that sort of stuff. It turned, the COVID turned our cities into sort of decurico paintings where maybe, you know, you see one or two figures at best. Um, so I figured it was probably a good time. And one of the things we could do is go back through the collection and pick out images that have to do not just with architecture and the facades and the, you know, the appearance of the city, not, but also, you know, vignettes of city life, things that might happen on a street corner, typical stories, you know, oddities, humor. And um, 
for the title of the exhibition, I was thinking originally it was uh, before I'd even selected images, I'd sort of tried to figure out a title. I kept thinking of adjectives for what might uh, describe a city. And obviously dynamic was one of them. And then you think of the downside of city, I thought squalid might be another, and then splendid finally in the end. So that's how the title came about, is the idea of capturing a, a full range of, of experience to do with the cities. This is all done using the prints and drawings collection. Unfortunately, we had enough material to make a small shop. Oh, absolutely, and uh, and and so as you walk into the exhibition, we're gonna we're gonna type kind of um, take our audience through the exhibition, looking at um, pairs of objects, uh, pairs of works of art that that um, seem to resonate, and in some cases that you've placed side by side on the walls. In fact, in, in several cases. Um, and so as you uh, enter the show and turn to your left, uh, the first two images that you see side by side are in the next slide, please. And uh, we have uh, Wenzel Holler's um, uh, view of the cathedral in Antwerp, I believe. And yep. then this uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, smaller etching by Jacques Callot. And I was just struck by their juxtaposition, as I was by many of the uh, uh, juxtapositions you set out in the in the exhibition. But I'd I'd love to hear your thought on uh, this um, pair. Well, they're quite different kinds of things. Uh, Holler was uh, an engraver, sometime an etch, a maker of etchings more than engravings, and he had the ability, nonetheless, with etching to make these incredibly fine ruled lines so that you it might almost masquerade as an engraving. That was mm -hmm. a great help to him because he copied a lot of works of art and that was part of his program. Um, but here is the idea of the, the absolute central building in the city of Antwerp, which was maybe not the largest city in Europe at the time, but certainly the wealthiest. And this building, which just dominates and aspires up to the heavens is really, I think, gives you an idea of what the, the heart of a, a European capital would have in it. Um, it took 173 years to build. It gives you some idea of the determination and the long range planning and thinking that, that is capable in such cities. The Protestants tried to burn it down during the wars of religion in the late 16th century. And it was restored and ended up filled up with masterpieces by artists like Rubens uh, when they had to redecorate after the despoliation. So it's all, you know, it's all very, I would describe it as a very conservative vocabulary and that a very impersonal, almost like an architect's drawing and all the rest. But nonetheless, uh, people would have looked at that and said, you know, yes, you know, the mighty cathedral of, of Antwerp. On the right, the Calo is a little different. It's a little more sketched by hand. It's got odd bits like little bits of smoke drifting off across the top of the, uh, of the frame. And this tower, which is nowhere near as tall as the tower in Antwerp, uh, the tower of the cathedral, but it's prominent. And Calo gives it this kind of heroic you know, stature. It stands well above the skyline and everything else. The title is The View of the Pont Neuf, which is behind it, of course, and was the largest to date uh, civic project in Paris. The tower, the, it's the Tour de Nesle, uh, named after, the, I think, the 13th century family that originally built it. Um, and it's um, one of four towers that on the uh, four guard towers uh, that are part of the uh, walls of Paris on the Ile de France. And this was the one that was most upstream. The little thing that you see hanging off the end of it was probably a lantern and um, that would have served for evening or nighttime navigation. Because if you were coming downstream, it would be the first light that, you know, one of the first lights that you would see. So it's interesting. He's conjoined two points of view here. One on the left that shows you the Pont Neuf and the other on the right that gives you a view down along the city walls. Um, and this sort of double perspective, uh, you know, fusing old and new monuments. Um, 
the um, this is perhaps one of Kello's best known images. And of course, the draftsmanship in it is a lot more personal. It's a little more scratchy. Um, you see a lot more of his hand in it. And there's a kind of wonderful contrast between the really little thin bits and the, uh, the broader shading sometimes, the way things hang out. I really love the way the lantern hangs against the space of the open sky, for example. So. And and so also um, in that print, just to the to the uh, left of the tower and right under the lantern, you see the silhouette of uh, of Notre Dame. Yeah, in the distance, dead center in the in the print, almost. I should add that Callot was one of the most influential printmakers in the history of art, in the history of Western art, at least, because he also he, he did not on not just monuments but uh, figures figures and street scenes and, and endless number of things. So prints were widely distributed everywhere and became a kind of Bible for later artists. And for two centuries, you can, you know, you can be looking at a Magnasco, or you can be looking at a, someone else and all of a sudden, oh, there it is. You know, there's the Kello drawing that's behind it or the, the print that's behind it. Even 18th century German um, ivory carvings made you know, after Kello prints. That's how popular and pervasive they were. Yeah, yeah. Well, we jump ahead about uh, a century, I believe, uh, with the next uh, slide. And um, you're on the long wall in the Rays Gallery. Uh, we, we find ourselves with this kind of uh, wonderful suite, um, kind of anchors the wall of uh, prints by Piranesi. And uh, many of us, came to know Piranesi best, perhaps, because of his Carceri, which became um, kind of a harbinger of later Romanticism um, with the uh, cavernous uh, uh, prison-like spaces that he created, uh, rising um, in long stairways and gangplanks and all kinds of things um, uh, into, into, into the uh, upper reaches of the prince. Um, but they're etchings. And, and in fact, most of his career, um, the vast majority of his work, um, was more like what we're seeing on the screen right now and the several other prints that you have on view uh, in the show. So talk to us, please, about, about the works that you selected, particularly this one. Well, um, Piranesi's work encompasses all kinds of things from the depiction of what were considered to be modern buildings of the time uh, like the Quirinal Palace and the um, Palazzo Descalzi, that a facade by Bernini, and along with those, he was also, but he was renowned for his um, or his depictions of the ancient Rome. Sometimes of the ruins, sometimes with a somewhat imaginative reconstruction to them. Sometimes very technical ground plans and you know the sort of careful drawings an archaeologist would make. In fact, he was recognized as an archaeologist by the British, I forget which society made him a member almost immediately upon publication of two of his chief works, The Antiquities of Rome and Views of Rome. And these both contained a mixture of old ruins as well as uh, new buildings. Um, and they made him. They made him almost instantly famous. He. The uh, this is a view of back from the um, Via Appia to the uh, Campo Marzio, um, which was a large flat area uh, outside the walls of Rome back in ancient Roman times, it slowly it got built up. Uh, Domitian in 80 AD built a circus there, which later became the Piazza Navona, if you've been to Rome. And um, in, by, the, by, the, by the several centuries uh, AD, it was lined with monuments. The first five or 10 miles had all kinds of things, like the gigantic tomb of Cecilia Metella, the huge circular, Monument, monumental tomb, probably everybody who's been to Rome has seen that. Um, various kinds of burial grounds for different emperors, Hebrew catacombs, uh, there was just an, um, a wealth of monuments lining the 
the road. The road itself was originally military in purpose to take troops and material south when eventually got expanded to Brindisi. But here you have an idea, and I have not yet started what's, I mean, there's a good bit of fantasy to it, but then also some reality. You, there's, you see that there are obelisks lining the road along with some historiated columns, which no doubt narrate you know, the, uh, the conquests of uh, various military rulers. And then you have this jum wonderful jumble of statuary and everything else in front. And I think the, the thing about it is it's the jumble of statuary and this kind of feeling of something growing up into ruins almost is very much something that you find the sensibility for it in Piranesi, like you find it in almost nobody else. I can't think of an artist who's so well attuned to how you have the modern mixed in with the ancient uh, collage together and you know pervading each other. And also, I, I would say, when you go to the exhibition, look for the print of the uh, ruins of the the graves of the family freedmen and slaves of Augustus. Because there it is, it's the tomb of one of the greatest Roman emperors, and it's being disfoliated by grave robbers pulling off sarcophagus lids and grabbing rings from the corpses. And Piranesi and a kind of real sort of, uh, I don't know, just an ability to relish the contradictions uh, seems to delight in depicting deformed cripples and other people who hung out in these ruins, robbers and grave diggers and all the rest. So it, all the squalid glory splendid is all there and, and once. I think the Piranesi has been one of the ones to kind of capture that to its fullest. Terrific, terrific. So right next to this print, I believe, is uh, we go from this incredibly dramatic vista uh, uh, perspective view of, of, of this uh, monument lined route to uh, a very quiet image in the next slide. Uh, a wonderful, and, and I'm talking about the image on the left, um, this wonderful small uh, uh, woodblock print um, by an artist who we know a lot less about. Um, her name is Muriel Hudson. Um, and by the way, I'm juxtaposing her image of Venice with that of uh, Paul Signac. This is a small watercolor in our collection. Um, our yeah. listeners may know Paul Signac as one of the great uh, pointillist painters of the late 19th century, but he, um, he, he, he like, uh, like many artists who outlive their original style, he, he uh, began to paint more broadly. Uh, and this, uh, this small watercolor um, sketch of uh, the church in Venice just has this wonderful shimmering quality. Um, the, the building seems to dance as much as the light across the water. Um, can you comment on these? Um, they were placed in their position in the exhibition. Uh, sometimes, curate, sometimes curators uh, might rightfully be accused of a certain glibness. Piranesi was a Venetian, so I jumped into Venetian subjects right after that. Also, there were some water uh, themes in, in Piranesi. The church is Santa Maria della Saluta, which was uh constructed the architect was Baldassare Longhena, who was considered the, the greatest Baroque architect in Venice, and was famously the the church was painted by uh Antonio Guardi and, and other of the Vedutisti in the 18th century. And once that happened, it they it became a destination for artists right on through Whistler. Uh, Monet went there and painted the church. Turner painted the church, everybody painted the church. Um, Signac would have been one of the, you know, the, the late travelers, but he did a lot of, he did a lot of Venetian scenes actually in watercolor. Muriel Hudson, we know almost nothing about her. She was born in Canada and she moved to the US, studied in Sausalito, California with someone named Morley Fletcher, but she was also very good friends with a man named Elliot O'Hara who is the guru of watercolor uh, in the uh, early 20th century in the United States, and a close friend of Ralph Norton, um, and I think helped guide Norton's collecting of watercolor. So the woodblock print, of course, is 
the closest thing in the in a print that really approximates the watercolor. Uh, and so it was, she may be a a less well known artist and uh, all the rest of it, but it seemed an attractive image. And part of the purpose of this, actually, I haven't done the survey, is to pull certain things out from what people normally think of as the reserves, which because they're reserves, never get used that much. Um, is to pull some of these things out so we can have a look at them. And I thought her, I thought her image was really worth a, uh, worth doing that. And it seemed to match up naturally with the Signac. Absolutely. No, I think pulling it out was a wonderful idea because it does uh, reveal the, the the richness of those of those um, uh, of our holdings and and uh, also uh, let us celebrate a, a lesser known artist. Um, so in, with the next pair, we're actually turning from some of these celebrated vistas and view and 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 sites uh, in European cities, and now uh, looking at um, and definitely uh, again and within the modern era, um, looking at uh, the people uh, and uh, and and lifestyle of of the city. Um, we compare uh, the work on the left by uh, uh, art, an artist. A French artist named Constantine Guy, and um, uh, the uh, figure on the right uh, by Reginald Marsh. The um, the work by Guy shows two women at a cabaret, and if you think of most of the cabaret pictures that we know from art history, those wonderful ones done by Lautrec and others, we tend to think of them as places where phrase I like to use, colorful dissolution. Where you could go and, you know, uh, in, indulge yourself in, uh, you know, wine, absinthe, narcotics, whatever you wanted. And they were pretty, you know, pretty nicely dissolute places. This one by Geese, on the other hand, has none of that. It's got none of the verve, none of the taste. In fact, if anything, it seems to strike a note of very gloomy decadence. All these women lined up in the back when not quite sure why, and these two sort of proudly sweeping through the front of it. I often liken the mood of this to parts of the movie with uh, Tom Cruise, Eyed Wise Shut, in which they go through this horrendous story of an evening. Everything is gloomy and dreary and decadent, and all that. this seems very much. But what's interesting about it is that is very much in tune with the poetry. Uh, in a volume Why? like Baudelaire's Spring de Paris. And in fact, Peace was the guy, everyone said, you know, Manet was the painter of modern life. Well, he may well have been, but when Baudelaire was writing reviews and talking about the painter of modern life, it was really this guy, Peace, he was talking about. He was, in, he was, you know, sort of infatuated with this illustrator. So that gives you a taste of sort of the, the, the first, you know, kind of negative, uh, world weary, uh, dreary, uh, you know, part of the city. On the right, um, you know, the contrast could not be stronger. Is the we've got a, a young, attractive American woman who walks with considerable pep in her step, carrying something in her right hand, independent, strong. Uh, Marsha's women, it's very interesting, really uh, often have this quality, even while at the same time they're being admired you know, for their for their beauty or their sexiness. He gives them a strength uh, and an independence that is quite remarkable, and so, our she's I think of her as kind of you know one of the brave heroines of the walking along the street, sort of nicely attired and very much about going about her own business with no need of men or anybody else for that matter. So mm -hmm. it, it's a lovely little study. Marsh is a case of a guy who he also he was placed with the social realists, but it also helps I think to think of him. Uh, I don't know, as someone who uh, painted a traditional style, went back to the old masters, to Rubens uh, and others for that wonderful rhythm of the hand, the use of grisaille uh, to model the figure. And it's sort of, he's a sort of particular case of a guy who developed a, a his own version of a traditional style and did very, very well at it. And the white highlights in this in this drawing actually recall that kind of old masterish drawing, don't they? Absolutely, yes. So um, 
again, I want to invite our, our listeners. Your comments are wonderful. Uh, if you have questions uh, that you'd like to share, um, please do uh, add them to the chat and I'll, uh, I'll come back to them. Um, so in our, uh, we're, we're, we're going to tip back and forth between um, views of the city and vistas and um, its inhabitants for the next few slides. So if um, I could have the next comparison, this was also uh, a pair uh, hanging side by side that really struck me. And one of the things that struck me the most, I guess, is just the wonderful sense of atmosphere um, that both of these artists create. Um, there's a, I think I've been in New York in that kind of weather. Um, and and so I, I uh, wanted uh, to ask you to share a little bit about Nevinson and then John Taylor Arms on the right. Nevinson was one of the discoveries uh, when I did the survey of prints and drawings for the museum. Um, it was in the bottom of a drawer. Some perspicacious curator had bought it for 15 pounds uh, somewhere in a shop on London Bridge. And needless to say, we wouldn't be able to touch it for anywhere near that today. It's probably for being, it's, it's very, it has peculiarly English qualities. It's mezzotint, which was reached its height, I think, in 18th century England because of its ability to create intermediate tones. You take a copper plate, you have a roller with lots of little teeth on it, you roll it back and forth until you roll the hell out of it, and then you burnish it away to get your highlights. And it gives you these deep velvety, uh, you know, blacks and wonderful half tones. So he's working in a very old technique here, mezzotint. And but at the same time, he's um, it's probably one of the best essays in a cubist style in early uh, British modernism. A remarkable uh, picture in some ways. It's uh, influenced by cubism and futurism. The date is 1918. So it's, it, it really does have some qualities of earliness and all the rest. Now, what's interesting is that Nevinson, we look at this and like many Cubist works, it's got this wonderful smoky, you know, it's from out to the planes of the interior, the intersection you know, in different ways that kind of fascinate the eye for long periods of time. But he thought of this scene as one of, you know, more like T.S. Eliot's wasteland. Uh, you know, you think he was thinking factory smoke and dreary city and all the rest of it. All the, so that was what was on his mind, even though we might find it exquisitely beautiful, <laughs> which is an interesting feature. On the right was uh, John Taylor Arms, who was no avant-gardist for sure. I mean, he came out of the background of Whistler and this and used to do specialized in medieval stonework and castles and that sort of thing. And he was incredibly facile with etching. In fact, he, there was, we, the museum has a piece called a demonstration piece in which he was able to draw, produce, print an Italian, an etching of an Italian hill town in 45 minutes. So he was kind of a, you know, speed. And a lot of his work, I, personally, I, I think is maybe, you know, not quite so interesting. On this one, however, he absolutely seems to have knocked it out of the park. It's aqua tint, which creates this wonderful tonality in the sky. You can burnish a little bit and the whites come up phosphorescent. It's a scene of Times Square. And after, you know, electrification is fairly new and skyscrapers are going up after having started in Chicago in the late 19th century. And it's just got this amazing, uh, kind of a, a, a glow and shimmer to it that seems to go beyond the reach of the frame. And a, a really remarkable work, work by arms, I think. And I think if also you've had images of New York City uh, from the 20th century, this would have to be counted really among one of the top ones. And, you know, your show, your exhibition also, uh, as, as you've been pointing out, um, really does also uh, take us through a wide range of printmaking techniques. Um, we saw the etchings of Callot and Wenzel. We saw the um, engraving by Piranesi. Uh, and, and now the mezzotint and the aqua tint, all of these using the metal plate as their basis, making marks on the metal plate, either by acid etching into it or by um, other sorts of uh, force 
um, engraving, uh, carving out those lines, or the mezzo tint, as you said, rocking the hell out of it. Um, but um, all of these techniques uh, developing uh, basically from the Renaissance through uh, the 19th century and uh, artists coming back to, as you said about Nevinson, coming back to that 18th century mezzo tint technique. Um, so it's a fascinating range of techniques that you've also uh, been able to share with us here. Uh, in the next image, we continue this essay in modernism and views of the city with this comparison between Fernand Leger's watercolor and a sketch um, by uh, Stuart Davis that um, may look familiar to some of our visitors, but will or viewers, but we'll 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 talk about that in a moment. Yeah. The, um, the Leger is called a herring skeleton, and it's that's probably that kind of funny shape there in the middle one that looks like it sits on top of a, a rectangular block in the middle of the picture. Um, why herring skeleton against the city? Leger, uh, early in his life, when he was more of, uh, you know, when he was working on the Cuba City, um, used a phrase that really was very important for him. He called it a contrast of forms. But then later on, when he introduced more subject matter and into his uh, pictures, it became not just contrast of forms, but just contrast. And sometimes the more contradictory and the more surprising they were, the more I think he enjoyed it. So you have a mixture of straight and circular shapes working against each other through the picture. You have the herring skeleton, which I'm not quite sure why it's there in the center. It's a little mysterious at first, the center of the building. And um, wonderful, you know, kind of contrast in the color between the blue and the red. Um, it's interesting to compare with the Davis on the right. The the Leger was one of a, a group of things, even though Dolly was in New York in the 40s, early 40s. The Leger on the right, um, I mean, excuse me, the Davis on the right is a study for a mural that is uh, downstairs in, uh, in the, uh, I don't know if I can tell where it is on. If we could have the next slide. Yeah. There it is. Well, it's called the New, New, York, New York Mural. And it was commission, commissioned for a show by the Museum of Modern Art. And in the study on the right, you can see Davis studying the sort of stepped skyline of buildings. Uh, he loves these, you know, repeated forms. And he, I can't read it directly, there, but he talks about observing the angularity of the forms in the, uh, in the drawing. And it's a study for the work. The work on the left has been described as an object portrait of the politician Al Smith. And now he was, uh, Davis was very much a, progressive uh, artist politically. And Al Smith wore bowler hats and he adapted this song called, Yes, We Have No Bananas. He adapted it to be his campaign song. So that explains the two bananas there in the bottom of the, of the picture. And all of this kind of fused together in a, in a jazzy way. You can see there's a little bit of borrowing the Miro-like head near the banana. Uh, and it reflects the late Cubism was very important for Davis. And this mural, which was uh, monumental, I think, shows how he adapted it uh, to his own ends, which it was an interesting and, and um, you know, there would be that kind of thing you think of as Cubism is usually being relatively small and intimate. And he adapted it to a mural size on a grand scale. I think it was also uh, the commission for the mural was intended to show what artists could do under the uh, WPA. Um, yeah. and this would be an example of it, sort of to encourage the others. Um, that's yeah. my speculative thought on that. So, <laughs> and and one of the things that I liked about the juxtaposition of the Leger and the um, and the Stuart Davis sketch. Uh, also is that um, when Stuart Davis went to spend some time in Paris during the 1920s, he actually had the opportunity to visit Leger's studio. Leger apparently was very complimentary about some of Stuart Davis's work and it must have been a great inspiration to him uh, as he was adopting certain qualities of Cubist art to an American 
American idiom and subject. Um, and as you say, his, his, his deep interest in politics uh, of his time um, is reflected in this, in this, um, in the subject of Al Smith uh, as he's represented through these, this symbolic landscape. Um, the sketch is one of, I think, five that was given to the museum in 1986 um, by the son of Stuart Davis, Earl Davis. And I yep. believe they, they came to the museum uh, not too long after the museum acquired a uh, New York mural. So it's a wonderful, a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to see that sketch again. We had a question from Vivian who asks whether the measurements of the of the Taylor Arms etching, and I do have the checklist here. Uh, Vivian, the print itself is ten and a half by six and three quarter inches, so it's quite small. Um, that will be image size. Excuse me. That would be image size. Image size, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, overall, um, Matt is 20 by 16. Um, so in the next image, uh, next slide, again, we come back to uh, the lives lived within the city. And uh, we do come back to a kind of um, uh, social uh, commentary um, in, in uh, some of the images that you've chosen here that I thought was quite powerful um, and I'd love it if you could discuss these two works. Well, the one on the left is uh, by George Grosch, a third class funeral, and that definitely falls into the squalid column. Um, what you have basically is a woman whose face you don't see. She's probably weeping with a, uh, some cheap flowers in her hand. She has swollen ankles, uh, looks like swollen and puffy. looks like she's been on her feet all day. And she's obviously bearing a child in that diminutive coffin uh, with this man who can't even bother to take the cigarette out of his mouth as he prepares uh, the coffin for burial. Chances are it's being buried standing up so as to save space and we'll have a simple cross and no other marker for the grave. So the, uh, the title is uh, absolutely scathing, which is... Um, Third class burial, one more little angel, one less recruit. Um, it was an anti war sentiment, gross thinking of the uh, First World War. And, you know, it's sort of the cre creating an angel but denying the government another recruit for the army. Uh, and it's his kind of impassive and sarcastic way of, of uh, commenting on the whole thing. The work, of course, Grosch was a very good watercolorist. Um, and so if you look at this closely in the gallery, you'll see how good he is, uh, how fluid the strokes are and all the rest. This is paired with a um, work by Jack Levine, who is a uh, kind of a satirist from the pre-World War II period in uh, social realism. Uh, who used to do, he did you know, various like ga gangster funerals and other sorts of subject matter, which he called his comedies. Um, and he would, he, he sort of made fun of all the gangsters with their, their like a bunch of pompous, overdressed little Super Marios, uh, sure. really scathing about them. And uh, on, but this is something else. This is based on a photograph by an anonymous photographer of the Warsaw Ghetto. And it's believed to have been taken, and that's why it's called it, to an unknown German photographer at the Warsaw Ghetto. It's not dated, but people uh, have hazarded, I guess, that it probably was around 1943, which was, uh, which Mark saw the largest Jewish uprising against the Nazis, for which they, um, uh, they repaid uh, the, uh, Jews of uh, uh, the Warsaw by uh, emptying the buildings of people and then burning the ghetto to the ground, a particularly horrible episode uh, in history. And here you have this sense of a fleeting life snatched, as it were, from under the noses of the SS guards who are probably emptying a building. And the tone is not satirical, but elegiac, uh, if anything. 
It's Levine's, you know, pan for the photographer and his own sort of way of uh, memorializing the victims. I think that falls into a different category we might call tragic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and the, the, uh, the two works here, um, as, as you mentioned, Robert, uh, Gross, um, both of them saw themselves as, as, as social critics, as I understand. And, uh, and Levine, uh, as, as quoted in his obituary from, from 2010 in the time, New York Times said, you have to defend the innocent and flay the guilty. Uh, as he said in, in so many of his images, he did just that. Um, technically, this is a lithograph uh, drawing on stone with an inky, uh, 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 oily, oily substance, which um, then through chemical process is uh, adhered to the stone and then uh, can be rolled with ink and printed onto paper. Um, and that technique allowed printmakers to approximate more closely techniques like charcoal drawing and things like that. So there's a wonderful range of, of, of uh, uh, tones in this piece. And just a second, what you said about the gross, uh, again, technically, um, he's, he's uh, dropping, uh, brushing uh, his, his watercolor onto wet paper to, to get those wonderful auras of color. Um, but it's a terrifically difficult technique to control. So it's, it's, it's really a masterpiece in that sense. Yeah. Um, I, I keep the gross on, on, on the screen for the next slide, but I uh, share the slide with a, uh, I think what we could call a much more celebratory work in the next image. <laughs> and um, and this, this by Jacob Lawrence, um, and one of his many images of, of libraries in which he sort of recapitulates his own experience as a young man living in Harlem, visiting the Schomburg Library, uh, and and really uh, finding his way as an artist in a sense through uh, understanding his history uh, as an African-American member of the city. Oh yeah, it's nice to go to this image because it has a way of kind of restoring your faith in things. <laughs> it's the, um, it's a, it's one of those, Lawrence always had a kind of a, a collage aesthetic and you can see that there's this wonderful sense of tattered fragments of color just moving all over rapidly over the surface. And you, if you look closely and watch the figures, they're all intent on something. They're intent on a book. They're intent on finding a book. There's just this sense of, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a feeling of joy and a, uh, thirst for knowledge. It's, I mean, it's no, uh, it's no secret that one of the really important things historically in the uh, history of uh, African American life in the United States is the importance of education. And so, when the Schomburg Library was founded, uh, and it's it's known today by the, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. It was a landmark and it drew all sorts of people to it. Uh, it was, you know, their front and center for the Harlem Renaissance, which was the first great, you know, one of the first really great flourishings of uh, uh, African-American literature uh, and all the rest. And in, uh, Lawrence, uh, many, many famous figures uh, went to the Schomburg to, to study, to learn. They could count on the books being there. So it hums with activity. And you can see, I mean, Lawrence himself spent time there when he was doing research for various projects of his. He wanted to get the historical details accurate. So you can see this is this is his homage, as it were, to one of the most you know significant places of learning for him in his life. Um, and this is a this is an, uh, a later image, you know, uh, his 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 career really begins, you could say, in the late 30s, but certainly by the early 40s. Yeah. And uh, this piece, I believe, is from the 1980s. Yeah, 1987. Yeah, yeah. Away with it. And, uh, uh, other... what did... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Uh, I have a question here uh, from Bruce. What is that representation in the doorway on the left side? I 
I, I defer to you, Robert, but I read them as, as figures kind of coming to and fro. Yeah, there are figures coming to and fro. There's a guy with the dark pants who looks to be coming toward us. Another figure there to the left, carrying something. I, I'd have to have the work closer in front of me to be able to, to say for sure. Part of it is you, know, you have to you have to sit and look a while at these things, let the images come, come out. Um, there's so much of this wonderful movement just in patches of color. So, yeah, well, Lawrence was yeah he was full steam ahead for his life. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we'll, we'll, uh, we're wrapping it up here. Just a couple more uh, images to share with everyone. Uh, and uh, if we could have the next slide. Um, we look at these two uh, kind of lighthearted uh, images of, of the city uh, by Dieter Roth on the left and Klaus Oldenburg on the right. The work by Dieter Roth. Dieter Roth was a Swiss artist who spent a lot of times in many different artistic circles, never seemed to quite settle down. He worked in all different kinds of style. Temperamentally, he seems very close to the Fluxus artists of the 60s who mixed easily, you know, illustration and painting and drawing and performance, so forth, not taking themselves or anybody else too terribly seriously. <laughs> uh, it was one of the wonderful offshoots of Dada. Um, he, the British pop artist Richard Hamilton had a collection of postcards of Piccadilly Circus because he collected that sort of uh, ephemera. And Roth was fascinated by them and decided to do a set of overpainted postcards, which he did. And then this was to the cover for it. Um, it's done by taking one shot of Piccadilly Circus, you can see it on the right, and then taking a picture of that, flopping the negative, and putting it over on the other side, so you could fold it in the middle. And you have this kind of cat's face he painted on it as superimposing. It was meant to be, you know, it wasn't a print, it was meant to be this sole object. Unfortunately, at some point in the past, a dealer got a hold of it and broke it up and sold off the postcards individually and we were left with a cover. But we're happy to have the color. It's it shows his rather, you know, whimsical humor, his love of uh he loves he, he loves the ephemerate and the lighthearted and the provocative. Um, so it's also you you'll by now remember that of course we looked at Piccadilly Circus at first. Uh, this one isn't a terribly crowded Pic Piccadilly Circus either, but it's, you know, probably early morning or late at night. I'm not sure which, probably early morning that wrote and has uh, decided to choose here. And on the, um, on the right, the print of the screw arch, which was meant for um, uh, 44th Street. The, um, there were originally seven prints, I believe, and a sculpture that accompanied it. And it showed the print showed the screw in all kinds of different guises, dancing along, floating away like a hot air balloon. Um, that was Clay Soldenberg ringing the changes on his motif. Um, but a very whimsical notion of a you know, monumental a monument. at the very heart of New York City. And New York City, if anything, is <coughs> well, cities in general are places of monuments. This is uh, Oldenburg's, you know, kind of homage to common objects in American uh, uh, life. Um, you'll know that he has certain preferred forms. One of them is, of course, the typewriter uh, eraser, which is out in front of the, uh, in the Norton, which illustrates the way he takes a certain form and really boils it down to his essentials, which is what he's in the process of doing one here. Um, and then riffing on it and playing with it yeah, and transforming yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Vivian asks about Dieter's image, uh, reminds her of, of Basquiat's work in many ways. What year is it? It's from 1977. So it precedes Basquiat's fame. Um, uh, but interesting, interesting thought. Um, I don't know whether either those artists ever crossed paths or might have been interested in one another. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, if anything, there, if there is any connection, it's through 
uh, the gen, you know, the appreciation of both artists for certain aspects of, you know, pop culture and all the rest of it, and their tendency to, you know, brush things freehanded. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at this point, if we could have next slide, um, it speaks for itself. <laughs> if anybody has any further questions that they would like to ask Robert about this exhibition, we would be delighted to have you join them and share them in the chat. Please do. Robert, I, I know that you have um, some exciting uh, upcoming projects as well. Um, and uh, we, are, we are looking forward to uh, continuing to work with you on new installations and exhibitions. But um, in the meantime, I can't thank you enough for bringing us this array of works uh, and, and allowing us to think about the, the city in, in fresh ways, particularly through, our, through this experience we've had over these last 15 or 16 months. Um, uh, okay, another question here from Bruce. What was the name of that colorful thick piece where I asked the question about the black? Okay, uh, that... Um, Schomburg Library. Yeah, Schomburg Library. That is uh, by Jacob Lawrence uh, from 1987. It's a silk screen on paper. Um, and if, if that does it, I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight and and robert again um thank you so much for sharing your evening with us my pleasure and uh so ladies and gentlemen we um look forward to having you join us again uh when uh we uh continue our L norton from home uh series and uh i believe that the next series uh talk that we have uh, will bring us back to the Chinese collection. Uh, let's see, on, uh, uh, excuse me here for a moment, uh, on Thursday, July 22nd at 6 p.m., uh, we will feature a conversation between Lori Barnes, our Elizabeth B. McGraw Curator of Chinese Art, and Ling En Lu, who is the Associate Curator of Early Chinese Art at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. The reason that this, uh, these two uh, curators will uh, have a conversation is that currently on view in the museum's collection is a wonderful 20th century painting by a Chinese artist named Zeng Yu Ho. And uh, her inspiration is a, um, a, a textbook example of Chinese art and painting from the Nelson Atkins. Um, and as you know, uh, Chinese artists frequently have in, uh, over the centuries uh, reflected and, and, and uh, painted uh, in, in relationship to earlier masterpieces. And this is a, a, a wonderful example of that and a great story uh, to explore. So we look forward to looking into those works with you on Thursday, July 22nd at 6 p.m. Until then, thank you so much for joining us for Norton From Home, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>